Coming up, two worlds collide. Sexy utilitarian. <laughs> Things will get racy with lace. Sex. My mom cannot see this. We go back to school with your favorite accessory. My first backpack when I was a kid, it was completely pink. And we'll put our beady eyes on a big, bold necklace. But first... It's kind of like a bad boy-ish sunglasses. A classic pair of sunglasses gets top billing. This is Style Factory. Okay, let's just get this out of the way. Aviator sunglasses can make literally anyone look cool. They even helped a young actor in the 80s. You may have heard of him. Tom Cruise comes to mind, you know, Top Gun. Top Gun. Tom Cruise wearing the aviators and they're pretty cool. So nerdy, I'm such a nerd. <laughs> it's so cool. Tom Cruise brought aviator sunglasses firmly into the spotlight in his star turning role as Maverick. Hotshot fighter pilot in the 1986 blockbuster, Top Gun. And the Super Sunnies haven't gone out of style since. There's a cool factor to aviators, and, it, and I think that some designers have really made it to, to, to something that's an everyday piece, a timeless piece, and it'll never go out. And that brings us neatly to the authentic military-grade aviator sunglasses, made for real Air Force pilots by a humble eyewear company based in Randolph, Massachusetts. It's called Randolph Engineering, run by second-generation owner Peter Voschkovich. My father, Jan Voschkovich, and his partner, Stanley Zaleski, were making machinery and tooling for other companies to make eyeglass frames. American manufacturers flying overseas created an opportunity for Randolph, who are proudly made in America to this day. Voschkovich Sr. snagged his first contract supplying these military-grade, battle-tested aviators to the U.S. Air Force in 1978. And then in the early 90s, we felt as though we had a great story, we had a great product. Why not take that to the commercial market? They're cool. It's kind of like a bad boy-ish sunglasses. They're comfortable. Everything about their design is for a pilot's comfort, keeping eyes on the skies and the instrument. Oversized lenses protect a big area of the face, reducing sun flare above the clouds. And the lightweight frame and arms mean you barely notice them. Perfect for long journeys, whatever the ride. The 22,000 square foot factory in Randolph makes their aviators pretty much the same way they always have, starting with high quality raw materials. The aviators are made of nickel silver, and the reason why is because it's a government specification. Specifically 18% nickel silver. The 25 pound spool of the metal is threaded into an automatic eye winding machine. This machine wraps the metal into the iconic frame shape, 990 frames per hour, or 17 per minute. Most aviator frames are a teardrop shape, but Randolph makes their lenses differently. They're square, they're not teardrop. They're more of a square shape. Men and women can wear it. It's just a great shape for everybody. Next, the hinge pieces are soldered onto each individual frame. Before the frame is closed, and sent to the joining station. This is where the brow bridge is soldered on, that little strip that binds the frames over the nose. A brow is used for two reasons. They add stability and for fashion as well. Now that the frame fronts are assembled, they're polished by hand. Hand polishing requires a lot of skill. Uh, you can very easily ruin a pair of frames if you don't know what you're doing. After polishing, 540 fronts at a time are taken to this tumbling barrel. Here, a bunch of wet ceramic media pellets vibrate at a high frequency, bringing out the mirror-like finish in the frames. What that does is it gives you a uniform finish uh, over the whole frame. Right, I like to say that every frame is treated like a piece of jewelry. And so a lot of attention goes into the finishing aspect of the product prior to, prior to plating. The frames are then given a quick ultrasonic cleaning. 
using high frequency vibrations in water to get rid of any dirt or dust. After the fronts are cleaned, the glasses arms, called temples in the biz, have their acetate tips pressed on. Then they're bent into shape before they're attached to the front's hinge using a big machine with a teeny tiny screwdriver. Press a pedal and the arm will pick up a screw and come over and insert the screw into the uh, hinge hole. Now the frames are ready for the lenses, which are popped in and tightened by hand. The mineral glass lenses absorb between 98 and 100% of the sun's harmful UV rays. Once again, perfect for the cockpit. The lightweight silicone nose pads are then attached and pressed into place. Lightweight nose pads are important when your jet plane is busy breaking the speed of sound. Well, I actually wear aviators. They are the most comfortable glasses out there. Absolutely, you barely feel like you're wearing a glass. I think as a man, we don't have too many accessories. Sunglasses are just one of those pieces that you can add to a look, but they're functional. Because if you wear sunglasses, you're not going to get swing, squint. You're not going to swing, squint, squint. Your eyes are not going to go like this, so you're going to protect them and you're not going to get wrinkles. Finally, each pair of finished aviators are reinforced and inspected to ensure they surpass military-grade quality. Now the aviators are packaged in their leather cases, ready for a pilot or someone almost as cool as a pilot to take them out for a spin. Just not at night, please. If you're wearing your sunglasses at night, I can't even tell you how tacky I find this. I don't think anybody should wear sunglasses at night, except Corey Hart. One of the greatest gifts a woman can give herself is some lace lingerie. I think that women primarily get lingerie for themselves, 100%. It just makes you feel different. But don't get us wrong. It's come hither glamour definitely screams something else loud and clear. Sex. <laughs> My mom cannot see this. I think that every man's vision of sexiness begins somehow with a woman in a lace slip. It's not only about wearing the lace for the bedroom nowadays. You can also take it on the street. That's right. The slip was introduced in the 1920s to be worn underneath clothing. But movie stars, models, and manic pixie dream girls have become ambassadors for the slip as a dress. Enter the Celeste, a satin charmeuse slip detailed with lace. The concept of this slip is to have a sexiness, but also be utilitarian at the same time. Two words you don't hear together often. Sexy utilitarian. <laughs> Manuka Clark is the owner of the California-based lingerie company, Far West, which started in New York nearly 50 years ago. Her lace adds a touch of ooh-la-la, -la, but she has to head east to get it. When I took over Far West, I came to New York and met with Faber Lace, and I decided then and there that I wasn't going to use any other lace. The clobber story goes back over 100 years to Munich, Germany, Barbara Lace was founded in 1859 by my great-great-grandmother, Rosa Clauber. We are the last lace-making facility of this type. Today, this family-owned company makes lever lace in this Greenwich, Rhode Island facility, run by fourth-generation lace maker York Roberts. Virtually, the machines that we have here are almost Victorian-type machines. They're that old, but they're that good, and they'll last forever. Manuka has picked the 860 lever lace for the ivory slip's sexy plunging necklines and elegant hem. Its beauty lies in the details, embellishments that aren't easy to make. It starts with a spool of yarn. This yarn is set onto a metallic frame called a creel, and its thread is drawn off the spool and onto a beam. A long spinning tube that winds the yarn around it. The lace's weave, or pattern, is set using a punch card system called the jacquard. So the jacquard is the brains of the machine, and the jacquard is what tells the threads how to move and how to position themselves to make that certain pattern. 
William makes the pattern by following a numbered configuration to punch a series of holes into these long cards. With the pattern loaded onto the lever machine, the yarn is fed onto a bobbin. It's uh, two brass discs that are riveted together. It's basically like a little spool. A thread is placed in between each of the bobbin's discs. Once it's wound up, there's anywhere between 120 to 140 yards of yarn spun onto each bobbin. Now they need a little help getting onto the lever machine. Well, a bobbin needs something to carry it through the machines. So we put the bobbins in what we call a carriage. There are 4,000 bobbins and carriages in each machine, holding 16,000 threads. And imagine, at one point, all of this was laboriously made by hand, making it very expensive. So lace really came of age in the 16th century, and the reason was profit motive. Women had started to wear very ornate clothing. Well, the aristocratic ones did. They were the only ones who could afford it. But by the 18th century, these cast iron machines came onto the scene, producing elegant, high quality lace suitable for royalty and beyond. Kate Milton's wedding dress was the quintessential moment for lace on a grand style scale. That Alexander McQueen dress just was everything. And I think it reminded us as to why lace is just so royal, regal, and important. The machine weaves the yarn by pulling the carriages back and forth, pulling the thread through, creating a weave. You can see the lace taking its shape on this large roll. It's a very light, netty feel that has eyelashes on the front of it, what we call the balloon or the scallop, kind of on the back. It gives it a nice look. It's this look that Manuka takes to the drawing board. I am very traditional. I look at the fabrics that I have before me, and then I'm inspired to create something. Once the lace is married to the satin slip, the result is the Celeste. Ready to wear underneath your clothes, to bed, or just because you feel like it. It's just so soft on your skin. It makes you feel elegant. It makes you feel sexy, too. It's like innocence, yet a little bit provocative. That juxtaposition just makes lace this beautiful, iconic fabric that we go back to again and again. You see it at the gym, at work, and everywhere in between. Backpacks are really trendy right now. I remember my first backpack when I was a kid. It was completely pink. Today's backpack has graduated beyond bright colors to a more grown-up version of the collegiate favorite, in leather. Leather backpacks? Love leather backpacks. You know, it combines that luxury and street together, and so you can have this really cool, trendy item, but then also, you know, bring it to a more luxurious price point. I think it's becoming more of a trend because of all the street style. In big cities like New York, it's super common to see everyone wearing a backpack. The designer Sophia Webster um, from London really reintroduced the backpack and made it kind of cool. I wear them all the time, so maybe I'm juvenile, but I like them. No way. When it comes to the BP66 backpack, age ain't nothing but a number. It can be worn fashionable. It can be worn in a more classic way. It's functional in its general architecture. It's got pockets, zips, it's clean, it's linear, and it's just fun to wear. Faye Mimarbashi is the VP of Marketing and Sales for the luxury leather goods company, M0851. The backpack, it's a staple element for us and has been for 30 years and probably will be for another 30. You know, I often say it's, we don't have clients, we have fans. Impressive stuff for a Canadian brand that works out of this 10,000 square foot studio in Montreal, Quebec. Where this backpack starts with, you guessed it, luxury leather. I love leather. I love leather. <laughs> Vesper is a full grain calfskin and it's got a spongier finish, which is a really fresh take on what we're used to seeing. Clay-colored skins are pulled from their massive collection and lined up according to thickness and color. We'll match the tones together because leather is a natural material. Within one color, you can have different shades. Earth tones are always a safe bet. Chances are they will preserve a little longer than those strong, bold shades. The skins are laid out and a worker uses a marker to circle any imperfections, like scratches or scars, that can affect the bag's overall quality. A good piece of leather should just feel soft and subtle, should be vibrant and have that little bit of bounce back to it. 
the leather's loaded onto a state-of-the-art Italian cutting machine. It has four DSLR cameras that snap photos of all the flaws. Where most cutting machines will cut through with laser, um, this one cuts through with a blade. Really cool technology. Cut pieces are peeled out and stacked, while Mario works on the backpack's lining, laying out long sheets of a soft nylon fabric called piyumi, one on top of the other. With the pattern on the stack, a cutting machine stamps stickers onto the lining's different pieces. These will guide the blade to cut in one swift movement. As for the straps, panels of leather are laminated or glued together and travel through a slicer. This separates them into long strips with tan leather on either side, a throwback to the old school. It's a sleek, functional backpack, uh, simple aesthetics. It's linear in its form and its architecture. So before the development of the modern backpack, students would actually use leather straps to hold their books together. It's not quite as practical as what we have now. Today, you can use one strap or two, depending on what's cooler at your school. Naturally, I'm usually a one-strap person on my right side. I can't do left solo. I'm a two-strap girl. With all the backpack's components treated and ready to go, workers start assembling the VP66. Leather pieces are sewn together. From there, the lining is sewn in the shape of the backpack. Next, the leather and lining are joined, and any stray threads are burned away. The straps are attached to the bag, and then the bag is done. And ready to rock the look we like to call back to school cool. Leather backpacks look really great, you know, with an outfit like that I'm wearing right now, super casual, streetwear look. But I actually really like the look too when you take it out of context and wear a backpack with a suit or like for women wearing it with a sundress. I think I put everything on my leather backpack. A book, a bottle of water, lipstick, makeup, everything is in there. Okay, who likes their jewelry big and loud? Chunky, chunky, chunky all the way. The brighter, shinier, the better. Then you'll love a Mayan cross necklace the unmissable centerpiece of the sweet romance line of costume jewelry. The Mayan cross necklace is uh, a beautiful composition that takes the colors of the earth, sangria red, flaming tangerine orange, aqua, and topaz. It's just a wonderful blend of colors. Shelley Cooper's lifelong passion for historical jewelry led her to start Sweet Romance where she brings antique jewelry, those dazzling showy costume pieces made popular by Hollywood starlets of a different era, back into fashion. The Hollywood stars of the 1950s wore a lot of costume jewelry, and this really helped to set trends among the wider population. Early on, Sweet Romance began taking the ideas from old jewelry, the silhouettes, the colorations, the palettes. The Maya necklace takes its inspiration, as you may have guessed, from the jewelry of the Maya culture, specifically the Yucatan of Mexico. Today, you'd be forgiven for thinking the big cross centerpiece represents Christianity, but its true symbolism predates Jesus by hundreds of years. Actually, the Mayan cross is a symbol of the tree of life, and it was really, really important for the culture of the Mayans. They regarded the cross as a symbol through which one could uh, receive uh, divine inspiration. Shelley's inspiration is simply history, and each piece begins as a hand-drawn design sketch, followed by a consultation with her team. I thought we would try to figure out how we're going to maybe make the glass correspond to the resin. I like it because it runs smoothly through the filigree. I'll produce a frontal illustration that shows frontal view and a side view, and I'll make it so that it is exactly to scale. Shelly then turns that cross-shaped tree of life into a mold. The bronze crosses are set in her 10,000-square-foot studio in Gardena, California, ready for bedazzling. First, the cross's gem cavities are buffed and polished. Then, colorful, top-secret liquid enamels are mixed before being skillfully dropped into the cavities. 
We decided to create a resin. Once it's deposited in place on the cavity where stone should go, it creates a domed surface. So it has the appearance of a stone. The cross will be held around the neck by three chains, a beaded chain and two brass chains. They get made while the resin dries. The bead chain is a mixture of hand-blown silica glass and ceramic. Each necklace contains 50 beads, which are painstakingly hand-threaded one at a time. The making of the beads has a filament, both gold and dark blue, that wind their way through the molten glass. And it sets up the idea of the embroidery that the Mayan women use. Gold was vital to the Maya culture, and Shelley's chosen to honor it by using gold-colored brass. Every chain loop is individually crimped by hand. To cap the chain off, dozens of glass crystals are meticulously glued in for extra sparkle. It's really, like, colorful, and I think it gives you more personality. When the necklace is done, it'll weigh about four ounces. But when you own the room, who's counting? The whole focus of your look is going to be the Mayan cross. So you should wear it with something white, maybe a white dress or maybe a white top, something like that. Finally, all three chains are gathered and threaded through the eye-catching Maya cross. The necklace is given a final inspection before being shipped to boutiques, jewelry stores, theaters, museums, and anywhere else. We go wherever we can get a purchase order. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!